Okay, well, why don't we go on to rotator cuff disease? So, in, uh, in talking about rotator cuff disease, as we talked about in the last couple of lectures, for a long time it was thought that impingement was a primary uh, pathology which led to injury to the rotator cuff that led to rotator cuff tears. Uh, that's no longer thought to be the case. It's now thought that uh, rotator cuff disease, uh, intrinsic breakdown of the rotator cuff itself, primarily most of the time starting at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon, is really the process of rotator cuff disease, typically either from overuse in the younger athlete or from uh, more chronic degenerative disease and older individuals where it's, it's very common. Uh, <clears throat> So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the pathogenesis of tendinopathy uh, in general and talk a little bit about tendon changes. Uh, more or less, the pathogenesis of uh, uh, disease of the tendons and ligaments have to do with uh, microscopic tears that involve the triple helix primary type 1 collagen fibers as well as tears of the transverse collagen fibers which tie them together. Uh, the body has a repair mechanism which repairs it, but uh, if you have the, the tear being produced at a more rapid rate than the body can repair it, then you end up with incomplete repair and more of a mucoid degenerative appearance to the tendon itself. That's the primary thing which occurs in the younger individuals. It tends to occur more commonly in areas of the tendon which has less vasculature because as we, I think, have talked about in other lectures, the ability of tissue to heal itself is very much proportional to the blood supply that it has. So in areas, in fact, for many years, it was felt that the critical zone of the supraspinatus tendon, which is about a centimeter proximal to its attachment, was a primary breakdown area for two reasons. One is that's where the impingement occurred, where the bony bone rubbed against the tendon. And also in microvascular uh, studies, it's been shown that that's the part of the tendon that has the poorest vascularity. Uh, now from MR studies and, and arthroscopy, we know that that's not the primary breakdown area of the supraspinatus tendon. It tends to be much more at the anterior uh, foot plate insertion of the tendon. Uh, but still, the, the lack of normal high level of vascularity to tendons and ligaments uh, is thought to be a predisposing factor to the ligaments not healing well with microscopic tears, which leads to the de degenerative changes in mechanical breakdown of the tendon. So this is uh, typically what you'd see, the triple helix of type 1 collagen. Uh, you have a inside this helix, you have water, which is the HTO2O molecules. If you have a normal tendon, you do have water within it, but we don't get a signal with MR because the T2 time is extremely short. It's down in the, in the, in the time frame around microseconds. And as we'll talk about in the physics section, uh, when we do our regular MR imaging studies, we typically have TE somewhere around 10 to 100 milliseconds. And if you have a structure where the T2 time is around a microsecond, uh, all of the signal has decayed before we ever get to a point where we we'll receive a signal. And therefore, for very short TE structures with standard MR imaging, we will get no signal and that will be black. And that's the case with tendons. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And uh, if you do ultra-short TE imaging where you have uh, echo times of around 50 to less microseconds, then you can start seeing signal intensity in tendons, and you can see signal intensity within cortical bone. And we'll show examples of that when we get to the physics section. The other thing is if you, uh, if you have an ordered structure like uh, collagen is in tendons, which has a preferential direction, it turns out if that, if that fiber is at around a 55 degree angle to the main magnetic field, then there are interactions between the water molecules at that, uh, at that angle, which leads to uh, lengthening of the TE time. And, and therefore, what might have been 
uh, black on a regular sequence, you'll start getting uh, increased signal intensity within it, and that's called magic angle artifact. And, and that's where that comes from, and we'll talk more about that in the physics section as well. But the normal tendon ligaments for all of our standard pulse sequences has tightly bound water, uh, and because the water is tightly bound and can't move, it has a very short TE time, and it's black. We don't get signal in intensity on it on our images. Now, if you start getting microscopic tears of the fiber, as you do with overuse, or certainly it can be accentuated if you have impingement processes occurring, or if you just overload the tendon and start producing tears, what happens is you get frayed ends of the collagen. Those can absorb water. The water there is absorbed, and it also has more degrees of freedom. And you start getting gray signal intensity on short TE images. Uh, but on long TE images, the T2 time is still so short that we don't get a signal on T2-weighted images. So you tend to start getting signal when you have this phenomenon occurring on any short TE images, whether they be gradient echo images or T1 type images, but on the long TE images, the T2 weighted images, the tendon stays black. And we typically call that tendinosis when we see that pattern. If you get more severe degenerative disease, you start getting pockets of free water that collect within the tendon. And this area is gonna be bright because now the T2 time is gonna be prolonged like more like free water. So it's gonna go from the area of you know 100 microseconds uh, up to TEs up around 2,000 seconds. And all of a sudden it's gonna become very bright. So we start seeing increased signal intensity on all pulse sequences when we start getting this more severe degenerative change. And then you can have points where you actually get puddling of water within the tendon, even though the tendon itself may still be grossly intact, you get pockets of free water and that becomes bright on both sequences. And that's really when it's a more severe tendinosis that we see. And uh, these will tend to coalesce together and produce partial tears which then can lead to complete tears. So that's really the kind of the, the, the stepwise changes that tendons go through going from a normal tendon to a degenerated tendon to a partially torn tendon to a completely ruptured tendon, uh, typical. So, so the T, T1 sequence is the early tendinosis of the, the sequence there. Yeah, so the T1s or the, and the, the short TE sequences are most sensitive for tendinosis, and that's where you see the tendon. They're also uh, most sensitive for magic angle artifact. The T2-weighted sequences are less sensitive for tendinosis, but are much more specific for partial and complete tears, which kind of fits in with what we talked about before when we talked about the technical aspects of doing shoulder imaging. And then if you get chronic tears in the healing mechanism, what can occur is that there are a lot of different things which, which can occur with healing, one of which is calcific, uh, uh, having either calcified, either calcium uh, coalescing in the tendon or pockets of uh, basically fluid that is milk of calcium, which is typically what calcific tendonitis is uh, when you go in there. And the calcium stage can either be symptomatic, highly symptomatic, or it, or it may not be symptomatic. And uh, the, the thing is that when you get uh, <clears throat> these calcium products, they can become very irritating to the tissues and produce an inflammatory reaction, which can be very painful. And we'll, we'll see examples of that. We'll talk about that. So let's go on now talk a little bit about rotator cuff tears. Uh, one is they're, they're very common. You, uh, in one study in cadavers, which tend to be older individuals or older previous individuals, uh, partial or full thickness uh, tears of the rotator cuff are extremely common. You'll see them in a third of all cadavers. So especially when people get older, uh, people walking around with asymptomatic uh, tears of the rotator cuff are actually very common. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, the clinical significance of tears, uh, rotator cuff tears at length as we go through talking about rotator cuff tears. Uh, not all of them are symptomatic. Not all of them need to be, need to be treated surgically, and we'll, we'll talk about that. 
It turns out in cadaver studies, articular side partial tears are more common than bursal side. Again, if the old theory that impingement was the primary source of rotator cuff disease, then you would expect the opposite. You would expect superior surface tears that would be rub under the osteophytes or callus of the AC joint or chromium, that, that uh, partial tears would be primarily bursal side. But it turns out that the vast majority are actually start on the uh, articular side, not the bursal side. And that's one of the reasons that along with some MR findings that uh, now make people believe that it's a primary yeah. failure of the tendon that produces rotator, most rotator cuff tears, not secondary to bony impingement. And we also know that in overhead athletes, high-level overhead athletes, about 40% have partial or full thickness tears, especially if you start talking about Major League Baseball catchers and pitchers, uh, partial tears are extremely common. And that's, that's from the fact that they use it and produce microscopic tears at a rate faster than they can repair it. Probably 100% uh, with age. Uh, you know, what we know is that in cadavers, a, a third of cadavers will, will have easily detectable tears. Uh, you know, I guess if you look more and more carefully, you're more likely to find a much higher rate than that in older individuals. Yeah, the problem when he wrote his book in 73, he, he, uh, he did cadaver studies, like 100 or, or more, and he found uh, everything was age dependent. Over 70, almost found like 70 percent or so uh, tears. Equal in men and women? Yes, pretty much equal in men. So it's it's um, a lot to do with age dependency, but in sports and, and pitchers, which are not normal people, uh, you, you know they get get the tears early. And it's a very complicated question about what kind of overuse activity leads to tears, because what we do know in Major League Baseball pitchers, and that is that pitchers who are put on a rotator cuff regimen where they actually do exercises to strengthen the rotator cuff muscles, and then presumably that would then, on a much slower time frame, strengthen the rotator cuff tendons as well, that the rate of tears is lower than on uh, people who are, are not under those. So really all the Major League Baseball teams now, the pitchers especially, uh, uh, have regimens where they they go through specific exercises to... Uh, to maintain the strength of the rotator cuff. So some exercises actually probably are protective and help help strengthen the tendon, and others probably lead to loss. And it, it probably comes down to the fact that if you do bursts of high-level activity that produce partial tears, that's probably leads is bad for the ten, tendon. Whereas if you do slower activity which gradually leads to strengthening of the muscle and the t that allows the tendon a chance to strengthen itself. Uh, and, that, and that's probably protective. So the exact type of activity and the kind of damage that occurs in the tissues with that activity is probably very important. Um, I, I also think how people sleep. Uh, everybody has a position of comfort. Uh, some people sleep in the fetal position, which is very, very common. And of course, the weight is on your shoulder. Uh, so uh, I think that probably has a lot to shoulder problems. I know it does to the neck. I think most herniated discs uh, that come around acutely are caused by the way a person sleeps on a chronic basis. Okay, nobody goes to sleep. You know, I know it's after lunch and it's dark in the room here, but yeah. Uh, so let's just let, look a little bit of let, let's look at what the tendon should look like on sequences. Now, uh, again, I use a little different technique than than most people do. I still like to use the traditional, actually a fast spinaco non-fat suppressed T2, but also the PD fat sat. But the normal tendon on the T1 and the T2 images, you should see the nice gray muscle, uh, the muscular tendinous junction where the different fibers of the tendon are attached into the muscle, the tendon itself coming over 
uh, in a very gentle manner. And we can see a little bit of increased signal intensity here in the critical, so-called critical zone of the tendon, in this case due to magic angle artifact, because that's where it typically is at 55 degree angles to the main magnetic field. And then it's dark again here at the insertion into the foot plate on the greater tuberosity. And this is just a T2-weighted image uh, showing the, the same sort of thing. When you develop a minor degree of ten, uh, moderate tendinosis, you can see increased signal intensity within the tendon on the short TE image. And in this particular case, there's enough so that we see increased signal intensity as a gray structure on the T2-weighted image. This is what we call tendinosis. The nice black structure inferiorly is intact. We would also now like to do a PD fat sat image to also evaluate it at this time, in which case this would be much brighter on a PD fat sat. And this would be um, moderate tendinosis, but we still don't have focal collections of fluid and therefore it's not bright on the T2-weighted image. So that's tendinosis. Uh, this arthrography can be helpful for looking at the tendon. Here we can see this is a, a contrast is placed into the joint space, oblique coronal T1 fat sat and PD fat sat images. What they show is a little irregularity to the inferior surface. This is a small partial tear. We like to divide partial tears, as you know, between those that are less than 50% of the thickness of the tendon and those that involve greater than 50% of the thickness for because of one paper in the sports medicine field suggesting that uh, that can differentiate symptomatic from non-symptomatic, and there are some arthroscopists who feel that if you debreed it, uh, partial tears that are greater than 50% of thickness, that that might have some advantages. Uh, not everybody agrees with that. But, uh, and then on the, yes, go ahead. Partial tears. I get confused. Are they talking about in the, like, you know, horizontal or the vertical direction or does it not matter like i get confused about that i was going to talk about vertical vertical superior to interior oh they okay. don't talk ap direction and what about if like if the tendon is thick and then this part is torn well there there are no no, no there are no the knife cuts in a shoulder unless they're crossed by some bad guy but the mother nature produces tears in every which way. So I think when we're talking about partial tears here, we're talking about um, superior to interior, interior to superior, whatever you want to use the term as. Okay. Of course, the patient's lying down, so you can say, you know, that's right. <laughs> So, yeah, so th that's, a, that's a very good question, and it's a cause of a lot of, uh, of uh, complications. Uh, when we say a complete tear, as John just described, in the shoulder, that doesn't mean that the entire supraspinatus tendon is torn and retracted. It, we're really talking about whether it's a full thickness tear going through the depth of the tendon. So partial tear, you can have th basically three kinds of partial tears. You can have a tear that where you have a tear of the inferior surface, which extends into the in interstitium of the tendon. You can have a tear that involves a superior surface with the inferior surface intact, which extends in. Or you can have just an interstitial tear where the tear is in the substance of the, of the tendon, but the superior and inferior surfaces are still intact. So those are basically the three types of partial tears that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the studies in cadavers have shown that the vast majority of partial tears involve predominantly the inferior surface, as we're seeing here. The next most common would involve the superior surface, most likely associated with impingement. And then the less common, but by no means rare, are interstitial tears that don't extend to either the superior or inferior surface. Now, some of the interstitial tears may well extend to a, a surface, but we can't always see that extension. But one of the markers that you can see with interstitial tears that lets you know that it probably extends to the joint side surface is that some of those, even though the surfaces look intact by MR, will have big fluid collections within them, and we'll see those. And they probably communicate with the joint space, but there's a small communication that we don't see so well. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk about also is that we'll often see erosions of the bone where the bone right around the foot plate is destroyed. And histologically, almost all of those are associated with partial tears of the rotator cuff in that location. So they're probably traction injuries of the bone, 
then the bone tries to heal it. But when you have repetitive injury, when the bone's trying to heal itself, you get primarily resorption of bone. And you don't get good healing unless you stabilize the structure so that there's no motion at that point, just like that clavicle we talked about earlier. And, uh, and so we'll be talking about that, that mechanism as we go through looking at some of the uh, pathology that we see in the shoulder with, with different rotator cuff tears. Does that answer to your satisfaction? Yeah. No, that it, it's the thickness of, of, of the tendon, not, not size of the tear in terms of from one direction to That's the other. That's what I get. I always yeah. thought but it was But this is strictly thickness that we're talking about. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, when we get to complete tears, we're going to also want to know the location and the size of the tear. But we're not there yet. Okay. So there we can see. Okay. What's under the rotator cuff? What's underneath it? Yeah. Um, well, underneath it should be the articular space. Basically, it should be the. No. Well, synovium. There's a capsule. No, there should be a synovial. And a okay, capsule and a synovial membrane. Okay. I think we see. <laughs> These are important structures. That synovial membrane keeps things alive. So you get a lot of blood supply and nourishment. Okay, so now here's another case where we can see that there is a lot of diffuse increased signal intensity on the T1-weighted image, even though these are noisy. We can see that the T2 looks fairly normal. And on the PD fat set, we can see a lot of increased signal intensity here as well. Now, this is a pattern which we call tendinosis and not a tear. Uh, now, here, here's a, uh, this is another kind of pathology. Now, here's a case where we have really a complete tear of the tendon, and this was repaired. This is, these are suture anchors for repair. And now we can see that the muscular tendinous junction is retracted from where it should be around the 12 o'clock position, this is actually the distal end of the tendon. And what we see here is a black scar tissue uh, extending back to the suture anchor placement. And this is what we call scar in situ. Now, notice here, this is an arthrogram. Notice that there's a lot of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. This is probably due to the fact that you have a tear and the, the construct, the surgical construct has broken down which has allowed the tendon to retract to this location. But just remember that it's the rule, not the exception. Even if you have a good arthroscopic repair of, repair of a rotator cuff tear, most of the time it's not watertight. Most of the time when you do an arthrogram, even with a successful repair of the rotator cuff, you'll see fluid going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So you can't use contrast extending into the bursa as a sign of a tear in an operated shoulder. Uh, this uh, scar in situ, now we've had, well, well, I'll show examples of this and we'll talk about some of the things you can see clinically with scar in situ. So anyway, this would be a complete tear, breakdown of the, of the construct with a scar in situ uh, in the area of the tendon. Okay. Uh, There's nothing you can say about the function of that shoulder by looking at the MRI. I doubt it that patient can abduct normally. So here's a 60-year-old with chronic pain, uh, rule out rotator cuff tear. Uh, let's see. Let me just see who's on. See, see if anybody else is on the call here. Ah, Yuri. Yuri, let's yeah. pick on, let's pick on you here. Sure. Well, what, do you, um, what do you think of this case? Well, I think there's a. Uh, partial thickness uh, tear of the supraspinatus tendon, uh, specifically involving uh, the articular surface fibers right there. Okay. Okay, so this is in 10-4. Uh, uh, Here we go on the, now on the sagittal images. Here's the sagittal T2-weighted image. We can really see that there's a lot of destruction of the anterior insertional fibers here. It's just a very thin layer of of what looks like fibrous tissue uh, overlying it in that location. 
but there's no contrast in the bursa. But look how abruptly the tin and kind of tends to become small in this location with just a thin layer uh, overlying the supus there. Uh, I thought that this was actually a full thickness tear with scar in situ here. Uh, this patient, when, when they went in arthroscopically, and because of the, dis the description in our report, the arthroscopist decided to, to go into the, uh, uh, first they looked at the joint side, and then they went into the, uh, to the uh, uh, bursal side. And when they looked down at the superior part of the cuff, it looked like the cuff was intact in this location. But then when, because of the description that we had in the report, they then probed this area. And as soon as they probed it, uh, they, uh, that scar tissue just kind of just melted away. So it was very friable. And they ended up then with the distal end of the tendon here. So what this was at surgery, let me just go. This, this is all scar here. This is actually from the, I think this is from the undersurface where you can see the after it's been debrided, where you can see that the cuff itself was pulled back to here, and this is all scar tissue there that's actually making it watertight, even though you have a, a massive tear and breakdown of the surface. So, so let's go back again. So what that's showing, we were looking up from below. What we could see there is that this, this is all scar tissue here, which is actually watertight and intact, but this was actually the distal end of the tendon. This end of the tendon right there is this edge of the tendon here. And this is the scar tissue uh, that they're looking up at. And it was very friable. They ended up debreeding the scar tissue and then repairing, doing another repair. And here they put in the suture anchors. This is the tendon now pulled back over the area of the tear uh, where it's sutured down. So they did a suture bridge cuff repair uh, of the that patient who had the cuff tear with scar in situ. Looking at a capsule in a synovial membrane that's fibrotic. Yes, and that may be what we're looking at. Um, yeah. So, so the the bottom line is you can have a functionally complete full thickness rotator cuff tear that's still watertight if you have scar in situ, uh, which has grown over it. So what happens is probably you get a tear. It tends to start retracting. Scar tissue builds up over it, and you get slow retraction, slow building up of scar to scar tissue to that uh, scar in situ. And functionally, from a, from the standpoint of a, a surgical management, the scar in situ is not functional tendon. So if you if uh, if clinically it's warranted, and they have a dysfunction, then you have to resect the scar tissue and repair the cut, the underlying cut. Yeah. Uh, now, we can have, you know, partial thickness tears that are quite extensive, right? And they could be like, you know, involving 90% of the fibers. How do we differentiate with that in scar and side to the extent of retraction? Yes, you don't see. Uh, you... Well, th there are several types there. If it's the typical type, you will, you'll have no retraction. The musculotendinous junction will be in the same location, and you'll see... Uh, continuity, nice continuity fibers with just of the superior fibers typically, with the under fibers just all tendinotic and, and irregular. But you can also get another kind of tear that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, where you can have a partial tear of the undersurface fibers. The, the upper fibers are still intact, but the top fibers that are torn can retract. And uh, I'll show that type in a minute as well. And that, that also needs to be described in your report when you see that. But we'll get to that in a minute. So there are a number of different tear characteristics which need to be described in the report. Uh, here, let's just talk a little bit uh, uh, some more about clinical aspects of rotator cuff disease. So here's a 49-year-old asymptomatic male who happened to be a radiologist that went into the scanner to test out a coil that, that we had. And here, what you can see, this is back in 1998, what you can see is that this is the sagittal T1-weighted images. This is anterior, this is posterior, and anteriorly we can see that there's some tendinosis at where the anterior fibers uh, insert on the foot plate. 
This is the PD fat sat image in that same area showing some tendinosis with a little bit of increased signal intensity there. So this is asymptomatic tendinosis. So Dr. Sabin, I have Mark from Stone Clinic asking in regards to that study. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. If he should perform it or not. Um, I'm going to talk to him real quick. Okay. 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 So, uh, so, so this would be tendinosis, which is asymptomatic at this particular time. Now, this is uh, nine years later, and this was after this was uh, uh, after this individual had pain for about four years from a body surfing injury in, uh, in Costa Rica. And the right, right oh, let's see, five months before this image was taken, the pain got much worse after a long airplane flight where the where the shoulder was really kept kind of stationary for an extended period of time. What we can see now in 62107 is in that area where we saw tendinosis before, we can actually see that there's a tear. This is the distal end of the tendon, and there's a little bit of scar in situ in place there. And this is in the sagittal image. Here's the sagittal image showing a complete uh, uh, full thickness tear measuring about a centimeter uh, at this particular time. So uh, it was decided to have surgery. The, the person chickened out at the last minute and declined. So we went through formal physical therapy at that particular time. And then this was on 62107. Oh, it's locked. Yeah, which, which unlocked? Okay. So, so so Aram, this was this is a tear a number of years later after a uh, body surfing accident in the same area of the of the tendinosis of the tendon, and here is on eight twenty oh seven. So this is six twenty one oh seven. This is eight twenty oh seven. At this time, the pain is actually starting to get significantly better, but we can still see the full thickness tear. Uh, but the symptoms were beginning to improve uh, with physical therapy. This is four months later. And we can see that there is kind of remodeling of the tendon. There's still the tear there, though we're starting to getting some scar tissue in here. At this time, the symptoms had completely gone away. Uh, uh, this is uh, a few months more, and we can actually see the scar in situ here developing. Uh, and at this time, the uh, patient went back to a full exercise program. Uh, and here we can see that there still is a tear there, with scar in situ too in, in the location of the tear. Uh, and this a year later. Yeah. And this was a full thickness tear, correct? This was a full thickness tear, and we can actually see a little bit of uh, osteophyte there, the acromion. Yeah, yeah, John's heard this before. So the was advised not to have surgery by me. <laughs> so anyway. Occasionally, I take your advice, John. Okay, so, okay, so, the, so this is my shoulder, so I know the symptoms very well in this particular mm -hmm. shoulder. But, the, but this just points out that uh, raises the question as, what actually produces the pain when you have a rotator cuff tear? Because we know a number of things. You can have a complete rotator cuff tear and have no pain at all. Uh, uh, you can have partial tears, which are extremely painful. You can have, in Major League Baseball pitchers, as we as I talked about the other day, you can have someone with a complete rotator, with full thickness rotator cuff tear, win the Cy Young Award. So, so there's a lot that needs to be understood about rotator cuff tears. Uh, my my personal bias toward what produces symptoms in rotator cuff disease is if you have act, uh, active tearing of tendon fibers, that's probably what produces the pain. And if you stabilize it so that you either develop enough scar tissue around it uh, or you strengthen the tendon so that you no longer have active tearing in the tendon, then it can become asymptomatic until you start developing degenerative disease, in which case you have a different mechanism of pain, but that's a different character of pain than the sharp pain that you get with rotator cuff tears. But it also, if you get any inflammatory conditions in the tendon, that can also produce pain.
uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that cause of pain when we talk about the inflammatory arthropathies and uh, and calcific tendonitis. Well, I think there's a number of different factors that cause pain uh, from pressure, from activity, microtrauma, uh, macrotrauma, uh, your anatomy, how you sleep, how you carry things, uh, etc. And some people have a massive tear and they don't have any pain. And other people have a small, tiny tear and they have severe pain. Um, how do you explain these things? I'm not sure I can. But I think if you have a tendon that completely tears, then that often becomes asymptomatic because you no longer have tearing going on. If you have a small partial tear, you may still have a lot of tear. If you put any pressure on that or any tension on that, you may have a lot of tears of the surrounding fibers because you have a weak point and you have uh, stress rises, which can lead to tearing of the adjacent fibers. So I, I, do, I do think that that's part of it. And one of the things then that we really like to look for on MR is, uh, especially on the PD fat set or T2 fat set type images, how much edema do you see in the tissues, both either the bone or the soft tissues around the area of the tear? The more edema you see, the more likely the patient is to be symptomatic. And that may in part be due to inflammation and things like calcific tendonitis, or in part due to uh, tearing occurring with edema and maybe even some hemorrhage in the area of ongoing tears of the fibers. Bursas are very sensitive, not just in the shoulder, but other parts of your body, like around the knee. And so Bursa can be aggravated by partial tears, complete tears, and so on, and cause symptoms. Uh, maybe it's not the impingement as much as as, as uh, pressing the bursa uh, by a torn tendon against the chromial process, and so on. So it's um, calcium deposits. Uh, that's a different level of life. We're going to talk about in a while. I don't think there's one single thing. It's a, it's a, can be a complex of a number of things. Thing, yeah, right. Yeah. So here's a, here's a different, and different radiologist, six year old radiologist who had shoulder pain and weakness. And here we can see that there's a full thickness rotator cuff tear, uh, maybe a centimeter and a half in the sagittal plane, maybe a centimeter in the coronal plane. But notice that there's a lot of edema in the tendon uh, surrounding it. This was on 42308. This is 3909. This patient also elected not to have surgery. Here we can see that a lot of the edema and the indistinctness of the fibers has gone away now. And we can see a little bit like my case, where we're seeing scarring develop in the area of the partial tear. And at this point, he was also totally asymptomatic and going back to full uh, athletic activity. What is the risk of re-rupture, though, in, in when they have scarring? Uh, I, uh, the question is, what is the risk of re-rupture? I think whenever you tear something like this, you're going to weaken it, and therefore it, it's going to put more strain on the surrounding tissues. And then it depends on how much you strengthen those other tissues. If you don't strengthen those other tissues and you give the same amount of traction that caused the tear to begin with, then those other tissues are going to tear. So a lot of it depends upon how much you strengthen the surrounding tissues. And the concept behind physical therapy in the presence of rotator cuff tears is to try to strengthen the tissues around the part of the tendon that's torn. So you do specific exercise to strengthen the adjacent tendons first, and then you go back and do exercises the, the, of the tendon that's actually torn. I don't think you should ever work on a supraspinatus tendon or build up the deltoid. I think you should only work on shoulder depressors. Teres minor, subscapularis, and infraspinatus are the muscles that you should work on. That presses your shoulder. You can actually feel my shoulder and I'll just show you how you can depress it. Because I got it there too, a lot longer than, uh, than uh, John. So, so, years so you like a yeah. depressed shoulder. <laughs> okay. So. <clears throat> So let's now talk about uh, a little bit further about partial tears. You can divide them up, and uh, we've already talked a little bit about this. 
We can divide partial tears up into acute muscle strains and tears, which we tend to see in the younger athletes, like the 20 year olds uh, and the, the late teens. We can get muscular tendinous junction tears, which occurs more in the later 20s. Uh, you get tendon proper tears, which are the more transverse or interstitial tears. Uh, I mean, you can get tendon proper, or you can get transverse tears. Tendon proper, you can get longitudinal tears, or you can get tears at the intersection or between the tendon and its insertion on the bone. So that's the, basically the kind of tears. There are grading systems. Uh, uh, Elman grading system out of UCLA uh, graded grade one was less than three millimeters in the thickness of the tear. Three millimeters to six was grade two. And grade three was greater than six six millimeters. Grade three would be associated if it's this is a if you're talking about the thickness here. That's what we're talking about. Grade three would be more or less the greater than fifty percent thickness type tear. Uh, but more recently. It's just you look at the estimate the size of the uh, the thickness of the tendon and determine whether it's less than or greater than 50%. It tends to be more what's used now. Now, in terms of partial uh, partial tears, there are other uh, nomenclature that's used. Uh, I'm not a big fan of all these, but uh, a lot of people like to, to, to talk about them. One is called a pasta lesion or a partial articular surface tendon avulsion. Uh, uh, really uh, publicized by Snyder, who is an, uh, a shoulder surgeon out in the valley here. Uh, he, he's also the one who really gave our current concept of slap tears and the one through four slap tears that we'll talk about later uh, were described by Snyder back, I believe it was 1990 in a, an article in, in arthroscopy. Uh, this is really a foot plate, of, uh, a, a tear at the foot plate insertion and a, of the inferior, typically around 40% of the inferior part of the tendon, and that inferior part of the tendon then retracts posteriorly, so the superior part of the tendon is still in place, the inferior tendon uh, retracts back, and I'll show examples of that. You can also get paint tears, partial thickness articular surface, uh, intratendinous tears, uh, tend to be an overhead con uh, uh, athletes by Conway and also primarily at the foot plate. Uh, so let's talk about some of these. This is actually a tear of the muscle itself, and we can see a tear uh, involving the infraspinatus muscle with the uh, edema within it and the inhomogeneity. Uh, here we can see on the axial image that, that area where the, the muscle is actually torn itself, and here we can see the muscle tear on the oblique sagittal images. This is a more severe example of a tear of the infraspinatus muscle. And here, diffuse abnormal signal intensity, also a little bit of the subscap in this particular case. So you can have muscle tears. Uh, this is a teres minor tear. And another teres minor tear with uh, probably a little bit of hematoma within it. 38-year-old male with shoulder pain and limitation of motion after a lifting injury. And here we can see marked atrophy of the teres minor tendon. Notice how big the other tendons are, how well developed they are. And here we can just see a lot of the uh, atrophy. Notice how on these chronic injuries, how poorly you can visualize them on the PD fat set, any of the fat suppressed images, because fat is actually a very good contrast agent for looking at a lot of chronic type pathology. Uh, here's that same individual. And here we can see the atrophy of the teres minor tendon in the oblique sagittal plane. Again, this is Oops, let me just point out again here. These are the fat suppressed images and how poorly you can visualize it. But on the sagittal T2 weighted image, we can see it very nicely because the fat is such a good contrast agent in these chronic injuries. Now, uh, here is a young athlete. Uh, I forgot exactly how this person injured their shoulder, but I've seen the same example in uh, quarterbacks who fall down with outstretched arms uh, playing. But what we can see here is edema within the supraspinatus insertion. The inferior surface, the superior surfaces are intact. On the T2-weighted images, there's no focal fluid collection here. And this is an acute strain to the supraspinatus tendon insertion. There's the T2-weighted image. And this obviously is treated conservatively and, and heals nicely as long as you don't re-injure it during the healing phase. 
uh, the history the history was of an acute injury, and it's a 14 year old, so you wouldn't expect tendinosis. So the history changes it into a diagnosis of acute strain. Uh, you won't see that in older individuals, 20 year or 30 year olds or 40 year olds. Uh, there, uh, you 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 would tend to get actual tears of the tendon rather than a strain pattern like that. And actually, this was a, a, a quarterback, a high school quarterback. And we can see here we have an, a, a partial tear that's really at the muscular tendinous junction of the supraspinatus uh, muscle and tendon. Uh, a little bit bright on the T2-weighted image. This was treated conservatively, and he did very well. Here's a 16-year-old male pitcher who has pain for throwing for two weeks. This was actually looking at a labral tear, but we can actually see that the pain here is due to a... Uh, strain of the distal supraspinatus muscle. And there it is on the PD fat sat. And there we can see the abnormality on the T2 sagittal. So that's a, a muscle strain. And then here's a weightlifting injury, a much more uh, extensive strain pattern to the supraspinatus muscle. And here we can see the, the muscle edema here. These are relatively uncommon. Uh, rotator cuff tears are much more common than these. But in the young athlete, uh, there's a much bigger spectrum of things that you have to look for. And obviously, they're treated completely different than, than rotator cuff tears. So it's important to, to make the proper diagnosis. And here's a partial tear of the muscular tendinous insertion, which is an interstitial partial tear. Then if we start looking at the other more typical partial tears, here we can see a lot of irregularity to the undersurface of the supraspinatus uh, tendon uh, irregularity. We don't see that nice, smooth black line. So this would be an undersurface partial tear. You can see the fluid going into a partial tear there. And on the T2-weighted image, we can actually see that there is a pocket of frank fluid uh, there, partial tear. Another example of a small little partial tear here, and you can see it on the axial images, or it looks like a partial tear. Uh, they... <clears throat> The, the one thing that you have to be careful about here is if you see uh, actually, well, there are two things to, to put in the differential. One is you can actually have a little separation bet sometimes between the infraspinatus and supraspinatus tendons. They tend to, the fibers tend to interdigitate more distally. Uh, so more distally, you should have a nice fibrous sheet. But proximally here, occasionally you can get a separation between the two. If the patient has had arthroscopy, you can also have defects due to arthroscopic portals that can look a little bit like this. And here, here's an example of an arthroscopic portal, which actually comes in. And that little defect there was actually a defect from the arthroscopic portal. So those are the two things to, to be concerned about. So now <laughs> there, is a, there is a very fuzzy line between tendinosis and partial tears. Uh, in fact, it's a continuum. There's not really a discrete event that differentiates the two. Uh, you typically, unless it's a young person who has acute trauma, the vast majority of patients, you start out with uh, a degenerative phenomenon within the tendon, and that continues until you have enough degeneration where the strength of the tendon has fallen below a certain level and, that is, and then daily, daily activity will uh, produce a strain of, of the weakened tendon. And so th that, can, that can be a very fuzzy line. Here's an example where we see increased signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon, but notice the superior and inferior surfaces are intact. So you could call this either severe tendinosis or an interstitial partial tear. I tend to use the term more tendinosis in a case like this. You can blow it up. And you can see the two, two surfaces are intact. And typically, if those surfaces are intact, you're not going to see much of an abnormality arthroscopically, even if there's a large problem in the interstitials of the, of the tendon. And this is early on was a cause for some concern about disagreements between arthroscopic findings and uh, MR findings that we now understand better. So are the terms in uh, interstitial, partial tear, and tendinosis? Uh, 
se severe tendinosis. Well, the, the way I differentiate them is the signal intensity on the T2-weighted images. And that's, again, why I like the non-fat suppressed T2-weighted images. Both tend to be quite bright on the PD fat sat images. And both are very bright on the T2 fat sat images. And neither of them are very, typically very bright on the T1 fat sat images. So I really find that the, the T2 is most helpful. If it really looks like fluid on a T2 image, then it's a partial tear. If it looks gray on the T2 weighted image, then I call it tendinosis. And that seems to work very well. Over the over many years, many yeah, thousands. Is today, uh, um, something microscopic and general in regards to what it looks like. Uh, a tear. That's what it is. A tear. The tendinosis mm -hmm. is not a tear. It's more of a microscopic phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Degeneration and or swelling and or. or so so so. So. so you could say a tear is just a defect in the tendon, where a place where there should be tendon, but there isn't tendon. And it tends to fill, when you have a place like that, it tends to fill with fluid. And therefore, if it's just a fluid collection, it's going to be bright on the T2-weighted image. If, however, it's abnormal tissue, but you have a lot of tissue there, and it's not, not an empty space, then that's more of a tendinosis. It's not normal tendon, but then it's not a complete defect in the tendon. And then it tends to be gray and signal intensity on the T2-weighted image. Uh, one is really just a more severe example than the other. Uh, for tendinosis, uh, you can say it's type 1 strain. Um, for a partial tear, type 2 strain. And a complete tear, type 3 strain. That's the R-A-I-N. Like ligaments, the same thing. Okay, now uh, here's another case where we can see increased signal intensity within the tendon on both the uh, uh, T2 coronal and T2 sagittal images. Uh, here's what it looks like on the oblique coronal PD fat sat images. And here, notice when we look at this, even though on the T2 weighted image it looks like there may be a little black line on the inferior surface. The, the black line sign uh, really should be determined really on the PD fat sat images. And here we see no black line there. So this, is a, this was actually a high-grade partial tear. And there was a big defect in the tendon at arthroscopy in this, in this example. So I think the T2-weighted image is, is helpful. This is quite bright on the T2-weighted image. But you really have to look at the combination. And typically, if it's tendinosis, you will see a thin black line like we're seeing on the top here uh, on the PD fat side on both sides. So uh, here's a case of a Major League Baseball pitcher uh, increasing axillary pain. They were concerned about a teres minor or latissimus dorsi tear, uh, which are uh, common injuries. In, in baseball pitchers. What we see here, however, this is on 42209. We can see that the inferior surface of the supraspinatus tendon is perfectly intact. What we're seeing is a bone erosion at its insertion. And we know from cadaver studies that this typically means that you have avulsion injuries of the bone in that location from overuse. That's what produces the erosion here. Uh, he continued to, to play. And uh, one month later, notice the difference in the way the tendon looks. You now have uh, no longer the black line at the bottom. And we actually see a tear extending from the tendon into the actual bone with increasing bone marrow and the erosion adjacent to the bone. So this is really progression of disease over that time. Uh, this, this is a, obviously a partial tear involving roughly 50% of the thickness of the tendon with the tear extending into uh, into the bone, into the large erosion within the bone, and these are bone, the, and these erosions again are associated with tears, and they're really due to traction injuries of the trabecular bone, where the where the bone is really the trabecular bone is damaged from the traction of the tendon on the bony insertion. So for every tear I see, I see five patients with these subchondral cystic changes and just tendinosis. So I don't understand because I feel like we see that so commonly, but we don't 
but they're not torn. Yes, and that's because uh, many people people will will damage the the supraspinatus tendon and the bone. We're leading to tendinosis, but they stop short of tearing the tendon. If they continue to do those activities, it will progress like it is in him. And if he continued this activity, he would go to a complete supraspinatus tendon tear as well. It's just that, uh, and the likelihood is that there is a stage where these become symptomatic. And when they become symptomatic, people back off of their activity, allowing it to heal. And a lot of what we see in the shoulder are changes from chronic disease where you have injury, then healing, then you go back to activity again, you re-injure it, and healing, and it, so it's an ongoing process where there's fighting between healing and, and injury. And so that's, but we can see this has progressed from a, from a, into a really a partial tear, a marrow edema. Another example, here we can see on the T1-weighted image, supraspinatus tendon coming down with a lot of increased signal intensity within it, and the erosion at the insertion of the tendon on the, on the greater tuberosity due to the traction, repetitive traction injury. And, uh, and here we can see this is really an interstitial partial tear going down uh, into the area where the bone has been injured and we have the bone erosion. So that you'll see this all the time. And, and this is most likely the disease mechanism which produces this. And uh, there will be stages where this is going to be symptomatic. And if you back off and it, and it heals, you can also have stages where it's asymptomatic. And again, you continue with that process between injury and healing, uh, uh, looking at the chronic changes. And then we'll later see chronic degenerative shoulders where that process has gone on to kind of the end stage. Here's a 17-year-old male with new onset shoulder pain, rule out uh, labral tear or bicep subluxation. And what we can see here, here is a partial tear where we can see that the inferior portion of the supraspinatus tendon has avulsed off its attachment to the foot plate. Uh, the superior attachment is still probably intact, though it's heavily tendinotic back here, and the inferior one has retracted, so this is a typical posta lesion. And here we can see a nice inferior partial tear, again best visualized on the PD fat side image, and here on the T2 weighted image we can see some increased signal intensity within it, greater than 50%. Now here's another Major League Baseball pitcher. On the T2-weighted image, we can see that there's interstitial fluid here, so it really looks like an interstitial tear. But on the PD fat set, we can see that we've lost that uh, dark line on the inferior surface, so this is really probably an inferior surface tear. And here we can see the, the fluid and the tear on the axial PD fat set image as well. And again, more examples of partial tears. Uh, and this one was not, let me talk a little bit about. Now, there are times when it, you can see what look like very large tears, especially the peripheral tears at the foot plate, which, which, and the surgeon would come back saying, look, I went in there, I saw everything very well, and it was normal. What are you telling me that there's a rotator cuff tear? Uh, and for these very peripheral tears like this, which are primary bursocited, uh, I, you, I think you can, you can have, in essence, a full thickness tear, but the, uh, but the capsule can still be intact in the synovium, and, you, and you're not going to be able to see it with the arthroscope. And uh, this was an example, that a significant tear of the tendon, probably responsible for the patient's symptoms, but it couldn't be seen at arthroscopy. From the articular side. It's From the articular the side. side they, 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 didn't, they didn't go into the bursal side here, but maybe or maybe not depending on exactly where the and tear is. The may plaster down over that area, and um, you may not see the through the bursa unless the guy starts probing away and starts tearing the bursa. So this is a relatively small tear. Is there any limitation? I mean, when you get that far... Is there any limitation when you get that far lateral in terms of getting your scope there, or do you see the osseous pedicle? You don't want to go too far. There's a, always a limit to how far you can go with scopes and, and irrigation systems and so on.
and uh, you start poking things too far, you're going to poke something like an artery or something, and then you're in trouble. And then you'll never go too so far. You can't see where it's going. And then there's a bit, there's a lot of debate between different surgeons as to what to do with this. There are certainly aggressive surgeons who, if they knew this was a case, they'd want to take it down and, and repair it. And there are others who would take a more conservative approach. So uh, that they have to, to do is um, judgment, uh, the ability to do something uh, as a carpenter, and, uh, and will this make the patient better? If you can improve on what's going on, um, then you want to operate on it. But if you, if you think that it's not going to change anything, then don't. And uh, don't is probably better than do in many cases if there's any doubt. Once you operate, once you stick that knife in there and suture so you can't go back, it's done. Okay, so why don't we stop here and we'll start here uh, tomorrow's lecture. Okay, any, any further questions? All right, thank you very much. The whole